is on my podcast slash YouTube channel this week, a long lost friend. Marvin Burton, how are you? Good afternoon. I'm very well, thank you. You? I'm very good. It's a pleasure to have you here on the on the podcast today. I thought what I'd do is I'd let you build it up <laughs> and then when you get to a point where it's tipping point, like how do I get it to the next level? <laughs> I'll come back in and just take it right up again. <laughs> Modest as ever. Always. That's what we love about you, Marv. I'm so happy that you're here. So you haven't made an appearance on my podcast for a while. So in a in a nutshell, where have you been? What have you been doing? Well, to be honest, the person she's been busy. She's been busy and change. You know, it's been um, getting older, getting a bit wiser, and finding where the areas are you can really do best. But for me, it was a bit. I was delivering some uh, fitness qualifications for the fire brigade believe it or not, over, it's over in Staffordshire, like Stoke Way, and I had a friend contact me and said, oh, there's a company that are looking for someone in business development, um, but it's in China. I'm only asking you because I know you've got history of Southeast Asia and going over there, because for anyone that didn't know, I, for sort of 15 years, I was to and fro, every month I'd do 10 to 20 days in a different country in Asia and coming back. And that all really spurred from delivering product training for so many different companies. Uh, this one fella in Southeast Asia kept saying, oh, can we have a master trainer for this and master trainer for that? And he kept getting me. Because at one, po- one point it was kind of, if you've stepped in me, I'm everywhere. <laughs> so, um, which wasn't a problem, but he was just like, it probably better just to, get, just to get you out here for a period of days and just get all the courses back to back. So I literally went day to day. Um, and the first day I went there, I'd blown away because we had 110 people. And the second day it was 120. I said, you've got to cap these. So we always had, I think 80 was the smallest group I ever had and 150 was the highest. Now it was all right for him. He's charging more 200 US dollars each for the course. So he did really well out of it, but that was all great, but lots of experience. And then when this China gig came up, it was like, well, you've, you've understand the market, you know, the, the challenges are out there. How would you like to go and live out there? Well, I think well, that's a bit different when you're staying there. But for anyone that doesn't know, and I, I'm going to guess most people don't, if you've, if you've ever been to Shanghai or you ever get a chance to, just go because you will be absolutely blown over. Um, they're 10, 20 years ahead when it comes to technology and innovation. They're, they're, they're such different, different ways of living, which is some, some, it's so much great. It's great for culture. But they're so well-rounded people. You know, I lived in a place called the French Concession, for example, and it was all trees that bent over the road and leaves on the ground and nice little coffee shops. And it was all very uh, cobbly streets. Um, but then you look at like the underground system for the amount of people there was so efficient. You know, I never once saw money because it was all on one app, which was the best thing. Their technology was, is so good. They use something called WeChat, which is you know, one of the best apps I've ever seen, but we'll never be able to use it because you need a Chinese bank account and to live there to get full access to it. So anyone that's listened to this, unless you are Chinese, will never know this, but I paid my utility bills on it. My wages went there. I paid for restaurants, I book restaurants. I did everything on it on one app and it was all your social media. You never needed anything else. It was your news, the lot. So it, it, they're so innovative. Anyway, so I went over there and, and this one day I was, yes, just dialed back one, one step. I was sat in the fire service and I got this message come through and it was on a Monday. The following Tuesday, I was in Shanghai for two days, um, having a look around and asking a load of questions and then came back Wednesday and uh, four weeks later, I was there. Um, so it was all very rock and roll and fast, but I think that the kind of people that we are, if you're not, if you're not reacting and trying to stay ahead, then you know where really, I think that's probably the, the biggest message we ever put out there, which is you need to go and do it right. because, you know, I learned this very on early on. I remember when I was 19 and I got, I went for an interview to work on a cruise ship and they said to me, um, just rang up out of the blue. They said, do you want to go and, do you want to come work on this cruise ship? It's going to be in, um, Barbados on Friday and it was Monday <laughs> and I'm like well I uh, don't know so I had to go go to where my mum works and ask for my mum <laughs> I didn't know what to do and I was like and she came rushing out she thought there's an emergency at home she said what's what's the matter I said mum can I go and work on a cruise ship in Barbados and she went um yeah if you like <laughs> if it, and if it doesn't work or you don't like it just come home <laughs> now that was it that was the sentence because as soon as she said that that's give that, that's me gone 
Now, I, I've been coming and going for my whole life because as soon as I see an opportunity, I'll go and do it because my motto is if I don't like it, you just come home. And I think for anyone listening to this, that's exactly what you should be doing. If you see an opportunity and you don't go and take it, someone else will and you can't then go back. The opportunity has gone. Yeah. So you've got, to get, you've got to be reactive, especially in the fitness industry or if you want a social media presence, you either do it or you, you last. Yeah, you've got to be ahead, but you, you've got to also have broad shoulders. Sorry, to, it's a bit of a long rant here, but you've also got to be be willing enough to to accept it either works or you learn from it. Yeah. You never lose. There's no such thing as a lost business or something that didn't work because the worst thing you can do is not do it and then regret it for the rest of your life. Uh, I feel like I'm like a one of these speakers, motivational okay. speakers. Very good. I'm impressed. I mean, if people have been following me for a long time, you'll know Marv. Marv and I toured the country for many years. <laughs> we yeah. had a lot of, we had a, I look at those days with such fun memories. We had such fun. We made some amazing people. We created some cracking workshops and we, we really did. We did have a lot of fun at that time. Yeah. Me, me, Kelly. Um, and I've always seen you as a really great communicator, educator, you are a great program designer and yet you always like to step back a little bit in the shadows and survey what's going on, look at the industry. Mm. Uh, and people might not see you for a few years. And maybe people may have seen you at Fitness Fiesta or, but possibly quite a lot of my audience haven't seen you for a while, but you've been in the industry, you've been in China, you've been doing lots of different things, working with other professionals, etc. And I wanted to get you on today because of your Chinese connection and because that you've done, had all that wealth of experience um and i just wondered where you thought now with what's happening with the the global pandemic and where we're going where do you see the fitness industry moving out of this how do you see things changing going forward i did speak to someone in singapore actually last week about this and he said if you can't measure it or wear it it's no good and this this guy literally is multimillionaire and he's the one that used to get me out for all the courses and stuff in southeast asia and he is ahead of everything you know distributing the whole lot and i can't i, I fully agree with him what a global, what this global pandemic has done is it filtered the people that were actually on the ball or off the ball and the ones that are off the ball that, that weren't paying attention that weren't keeping up with all the all the things that you think are painstaking that you think nothing actually really works, the update in your Instagram and your social media and emailing people back and being good at communicating. If you're not doing the basics, that's it. And we've seen that in not in the fitness industry, but every other industry, the ones that can't communicate with their customers haven't been able to survive. Mm. Uh, so many people have rang me over the last year and said, I don't know what to do because I'm about to cancel my over 65s group because they're all shielding. What am I going to do? I'm like, well, why don't you get them onto Zoom or get them onto something so you can speak to them so it's at least some social interaction? No, they won't do that. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. You've put your own barrier in, in front of you. If they don't know how to do it, is that not an opportunity to teach them? Yeah. Teach them how to do it. I went and dropped off an um, Amazon Echo at my grandmother-in-law's house. Set it up for you. Here it is. Plug it in. She plugs it in. She speaks to it, ring Marvin, comes up video call, she's next to me now, comes up, see her face. Anytime she wants to ring me, see her granddaughter, no problem. Anytime she's got a problem, she's on her own. She falls over, she can talk to it, ring, ring ambulance, ring whoever they want. So I've adapted her to it. So she's now doing more technology than most people now. So you've got to remember in our country and in your, in your if you look at Europe, Britain was the, the, the furthest behind the lap. In the, if it was a leaderboard, we'd be the bottom of the pile for technology and innovation. Every other country is ahead of us. We're so slow with 4G, 5G and all this Wi-Fi. I don't want to turn it into a tech conversation, but Good. the future is technology. And if you can't do it, what are you going to do? It's like when we talk to people on Pilates and we say, if you don't move it, you'll, if you don't move, you'll lose it. And once you've lost it, you can't regain it. That's a little bit like this. If you're willing to say, I don't know technology, I can't use a smartphone, I can't do Zoom, and you're just giving up, isn't that the same as someone that says, I've got, I don't know, scoliosis i've got fibromyalgia so i'm going to sit in the chair and do nothing you're giving up you're just stopping the best thing you can do is adapt because if that's the way things are going you're either on the journey or you're off and the journey's going and it's going faster than ever because it has to mm. so i think that to answer your question a little bit more directly where's the industry going it's all tech it's digital and you need those and that you've got to be long term you're not looking for a short-term fix 
because there are, and if you read the BBC or any other article, a lot of people won't rejoin gyms. A lot of people, we've got to adapt. They won't be going back into your village halls because some of them, this is not going to go away instantly. It will reduce and we'll get back to normality. But what is normality now? Because you know, I remember, I've been, I've been living in China. I wore a face mask to work every day. Mm. So this isn't a new thing for me. This is something that they, that's a way of life. So I fully expect people wearing face masks in shops in the future because they're going to protect against the common cold. Mm. But this is not abnormal anymore so don't think that one day we're going to rip off face masks and we're going to stop washing our hands you know we're asking people to wash their hands more i would like that anyway because yeah. i like cleanliness if i'm honest so where is the industry going to go people are going to evolve areas the gym space will look different you know everything will be you know how to get metrics and i think what people will focus on from a corporate level that's kind of already talked about which is measuring what people do the usage is is it working and basically putting a number on everything because that's what this is is it working we've always said it if you don't measure it you can't improve it and there's only so long someone will go to your fitness class or your gym and say i just go because i enjoy it because what happens is eventually you go i don't know if it's even working i've not lost any weight i don't look any different or whatever they perceive in the head then the negativity will creep in they'll just cancel they won't bother coming back so we could talk, talk, talk about retention because that's what technology is. It's how to retain people, how to engage people more and keep them coming back, which is as a fitness professional, that's what you want. You know, I was always on a soapbox of PTs that kept saying to me, want sales training. And I've said, I keep saying to them, you don't want sales training. You need retention training because right. you can get, you can attract people, but you can't keep people. And if you're keep, you keep losing people, that doesn't tell me your sales strategy is wrong. It tells me your retention's poor. Right. If you talking to people regularly and offering them support it's not going to work and um and my last little thing and i'll let you talk for a second if you want to ask anything <laughs> um, the thing that uh, just some more advice for people at fitness professionals is like me you probably follow 101 other fitness professionals so it can feel like when you go through your social feed you're seeing they're doing online classes they're doing online classes they're giving this advice they're telling people to sleep and not, not drink coffee after four o'clock we're all saying the same thing which is fine, but look at your followers and it's your friends, your family and the local people. They don't see those. And what happens is in your head, you think everyone's already doing it. Yeah. Everyone's already telling yeah. this. Yeah. So if I say it, I'm just going to be one of those people. Yes, you are, but you're not telling Marvin Burt and Rachel Holmes what to do. You're telling the people that trust you because they don't need Marvin Burt and Rachel Holmes. They want you. And it doesn't matter how much we tell them that we've done this and we've been there. They want you, your personality, your input, your social interaction. So if you're not doing it as well, you know, see it as if they're doing it, I'll do it. I always say the wheel's round and it works. Don't yeah. reinvent it. Just yeah. use it. You know, if you want to be number one selling author, just write a book on stretching. Yeah. Because you're never going to change the way it happens. It's the same. You can't copyright stretch your quads. <laughs> That's a really yeah. good point. You can't. Um, do you think, I think we've, we've, we've seen that it's been interesting where smaller fitness professionals who perhaps have got a community following, have jumped on, have created a digital platform for themselves, have worked the fingers to the bone, they've got the people on board, they've attracted new business, and actually they've taken a good percentage of a health club, perhaps that they worked in locally, that paid them perhaps a low amount, that didn't treat them particularly well. Um, I'm looking at my own, I'm thinking of my own situation. The day before lockdown, Virgin said to me that, you know, basically you're not coming back anyway. There's going to be no freestyle classes. We are, and I've worked for that company for 15 years. I've created programs for that company. That did not matter. You're gone. Your, your program's not standardized anymore. And it's the lockdown anyway. Thank you very much. Not in those uncertain terms. So it gives me great pleasure actually to step back and see those Virgin members coming into my monthly membership and, and are coming into my online offerings. And the majority saying, you know, they, they aren't going to go back. So what is the future of the gym? And what would the future of the fitness professional do you think be? So I take my situation, but there's so many people listening to this like me who've done the same thing. Do you think that uh, the clients will stay now online or do you think there's some kind of interaction needed, whether it's a monthly meetup, whether it's a weekly face-to-face, -face? but like you say, I think everybody thinks face-to-face -face is going to come back. We're all going to be 150 people in the class again because everybody will want to be together, but that's unlikely mm. to come back for a very, very long time. So how do you see it coming together for your sort of community instructor? 
Well, there's, there's lots of things. I mean, we're not that great in this country with things like outdoor space. And it's because we always blame the weather and say, well, people won't do it because it's raining. But if you put the facilities there, people will do it. I've always said that. You know, know yeah. As soon as you go on a holiday and you see that running route with the gym trail and the pull-up bars and all that, you still want to go and have a little go. I always do. And I, I get really excited when I go to Portugal, so they've got them everywhere. Yeah. And I think um, in this country, we've just got to step it up, you know, because our park's just like a play area and a muddy field and a football pitch. It, we're just not good at it, if I'm totally honest with you. So I think that we're going to have to develop that outdoor space and living and outdoor exercise will thrive i think from this because i think people will still like the outside and you know i'm talking to convert but if even if you if people walk a dog they don't say it's raining today i'm not going to walk my dog walk, <laughs> that's true you know and people that i mean people that live in derbyshire like us they're equipped you know i know that if i'm going to go for a walk in derbyshire i wear my wind and walkproof trousers and my walking boots and my coat it's fine i go in wind rain and snow and to be honest the worse the weather the more i want to get outside yeah. so anyway I think that that's fitness for you. I think people will adapt and, and then say, right, we'll, we'll look at other ways of exercising. Going back to your indoor space and outdoor space, I think there's going to be another evolution because I think the boutique model of, you know, small gym on a high street, you can go in and sweat for 40 minutes and come out is still going to work in your major cities. But I, I just think there'll be a decline in them because of the size. The problem is property nowadays is more expensive the bigger you go. So these large leisure centers don't really exist unless they've got thousands and thousands of people. And if we're saying thousands of thousands of people aren't going back to a gym, then we have another problem. So what we'll see is smaller space, but used more effectively. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I think that the group exercise might be a sacrifice mm -hmm. because the cost that you're as a landowner or a premises owner, mm -hmm. the thing that you're paying for is space. So if I've got a studio that's however square foot, Unless I can fill that with 20, 30 people, my cost per head is way too expensive, more expensive. That's why village halls have always been good at eight, 10 pound an hour, yeah, yeah. because you're going to get value for money. I think that gyms will have smaller, if not no studio and more functional space on the gym floor. And then people wanting group exercise, as we call it, will be then doing it online. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the summer months, spring to, you know, September time, Will almost it'll almost turn into what you see with music festivals like a Glastonbury where mm. there's outdoor stages and people doing it. Yeah. And people will be going and staying overnight because it, it's not even cost effective nowadays. You talked about things like Fitness Fiesta to find a venue that's got enough bed space for people to come and stay and sleep and overnight, and then people want to come and go because of kids. You might want a day pass, an overnight pass. I think outdoor space, even even a combination of, and you've seen these. Um, these outdoor festivals now that are holistic ones where they have live music, but you can also go and do yoga over there and go and have yeah. vegan food in the tent. I think that, I think these wellness events will pop up yeah. on the summer months where you go to it. I think people will just take a coat because it might rain and they'll just live with it because they'd rather be outside doing it because we've just spent a year inside. Yeah. So I think we're, you know what I mean? I just think people are going to value vitamin D and immune systems more. I think people eat healthy more. I mean, look at Boris Johnson. I know I don't want to bring him up, but he, <laughs> he knew that he looks better for it. He's got a personal <laughs> trainer, he's outdoor exercising, he's lost weight and he's looking better for it and feeling better. So isn't that an advert for everybody? Mm. So, you know, I think that there's going to be structurally changes, but I think the way people's behavior to, and the way they accept exercise will change as well. Mm, I'm honest with you. And I think it would change every, change the whole market. I do. I think something that you and I just touched on earlier, and I do think this is an opportunity. So I think we're going to see a huge opportunity with GP referral. So mm -hmm. how is that model going to change with so many people being sick, ill, having COVID? How do they get rehabilitated? How do they get fitter? Do you think we're going to see... Uh, training courses do you think we're going to see the NHS actually link up now with fitness professionals in providing rehab there's not going to be enough physios in hospitals to provide all the rehab surely with the amount of people that have got this disease how do you see this as an opportunity yeah. where medical and fitness come together and how can that happen how can it happen well all we spoke about with COVID-19 has been the overwhelming of the NHS because it's always been protect the NHS because they don't have the bed space, the staff, the capabilities. Now for years, all we've ever said was exercise is a preventative measure. If you were doing exercise and looking after yourself before, we would never have the amount of people on medication, the amount of people go into the hospital. You could literally cut the NHS um, admissions by a third if you just prescribed exercise before. 
you know, all these people that are getting type two diabetes, well, they didn't just get it overnight. They've been eating badly for probably years. So if we can educate people on there before, so I think that to answer your question again, well, how this is going to act the NHS now, and I know that they've got a 10 year uh, long-term plan. You can Google that and find a 10, 10 year NHS plan. It talks about the importance of they're getting more specific in the NHS because social prescribing is quite a big thing. And I've been on a few panels talking to, talking to them about this, where it's been, how do we solve, we, how do we react to the problem that we've got, but also prevent it in, in the future anyway, which is exactly what you're asking. And it's, it's about making exercise normal, not a hobby. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. When we talk about the new normal, I'm thinking the new normal is just being healthy because you should be doing it anyway. You know, if you say to somebody, um, you go to the gym three times a week, you say, oh, you've got, you, you're into that. Oh, that's your hobby. No, that's how I look yeah. after myself. You know, I also wash my car as well because I realise that if I don't wash it and look after it, it looks awful. <laughs> so, and the reason why I say it is because we always talk about in fitness, the body is the car you have to put the right fuel in it and you have to look after it and but you also have to clean it and wash it as well now for me cleaning and washing it and looking after it's doing exercise because if you're not doing that regularly the performance drops down and then you're more susceptible for breaking breaking down on a journey so that's what the nhs problem is we've got all the people queuing at the hospital because they're unhealthy now i'm not i'm not blaming people that have got covid for being unhealthy what i'm saying is we know that covid's more susceptible to people that have got that are have health issues so if they, the one learning we can take from this is we've got to get healthier. Mm. So they can't, it can't no longer be go on a GP referral scheme, do a scheme, do all this. There's got to be a, a, a pre-step before that. I mean, it's great to have a qualification, but we've got to structure this right back to what's the fundamentals, what does everybody need? And it can't just be do 30 minutes of exercise five days a week. It's too vague yeah. because I know that people are joining gyms and sitting in the coffee shop three times a week. They're not even going in the gym. There's plenty of them. You mentioned the gym just a minute ago that you that you used to teach at. You know, you see them full. Of, it's full every day with people having a coffee and saying, "I've been to the gym today." And what did you do? Three lattes. <laughs> <laughs> the health club that me and you used to teach at years ago. I remember somebody coming to my ten o'clock class and saying to me, with a, with a glass uh, with a latte in it, and, I, and the class had already started. It was ten past ten. It started at ten. I said, "Are you joining in?" She said, "When I'm finished my latte." She drank. <laughs> She drank a latte and put the glass down in the middle of the room. And I said, you're not leaving that there. <laughs> and I, you just can't, you can't write this stuff. But, <laughs> but you know, what is the future? It's, the future is people have just got to take it more seriously. And, and it's got to be seen as the norm, not a hobby, not an interest. It's not something that you might choose to do. Everyone needs to do it. It's, it's quite simple. And in that vein then, do you think um, fitness professionals should start to look at providing different services uh, how do you think they can change their their model their offerings to to accommodate what is going to be a huge i mean i, I can just see this being you know massive doing doing fitness rehab for for covid for recovery, COVID recovery. yeah i've done it with a few people already you do a brainstorm you write down in the mid in the middle health and well-being and you brainstorm the hell out of it what makes somebody healthy and happy right? Because exercise is only one element. I could, I could ring you up today and talk to you about fashion. And at the end of it, your mental health has been improved because of social interaction and a conversation that's interesting to you. Isn't that a part of health? Yeah. So when, when we're saying about health and well-being, we're not just talking about, I can take, take you through a hit class. Fitness professionals have got to expand this into different elements. And, the, and that's why the brainstorm works. Because if you brainstorm it and write everything down that makes you healthy and happy, you could, you could do oral hygiene, mental health, uh, relaxation techniques, cooking in the kitchen, things that you enjoy to watch on a Friday night, books that you've read, what's on Netflix. There's so many aspects to it. Doesn't that make up your, um, your whole homeostasis, to put a yeah. big word? Yeah. It's everything. Now, yeah. as a fitness professional... You've got, to, you've got to include that. If I go back to that woman that I spoke to her on that said she's going to cancel over 65s class, I said, why? Because those six, over 65s are going home. They live on their own. They've got no one to talk to. Ring them up and talk to them. Just say, how are you? And that's enough. And if you look, and I'll give you another example. If you look at the Halifax Bank, they've made nearly 300,000 wellbeing calls. How many of them are qualified in fitness? Yeah. Not a single one. That's a brilliant. A br I didn't know that. That's brilliant. Absolutely. All they're doing is ringing the customers and saying, how are you? Because they know that everyone's got financial difficulty. Do you want someone to talk to? That's all you need to do. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. 
ask someone how they are. You are clever, Marvin Burton. Well, I sit back and I survey. <laughs> this is really... Um, so what do you think, Annie, apart from having a brainstorm then, what do you think, um, what proactive steps can a fit pro be doing right now to mm -hmm. maybe position themselves for this, maybe find out more? Is there anywhere you can signpost anywhere or are we just at the beginning of this as an to idea? To be honest, yeah, this is... The next step is really for you to then... Let, so this is like more of a Tony Robbins trick. So let's say you write on that piece of paper, you've wrote 30 items down, then you put them in a priority list for you. What's your number one and what's your number two all the way up to 30? You start at one, you work your way down the list. And that's what you do. And what you can do then is you subcategorize them into two halves, active and passive. Well, what are the things I physically need to do? What are the things I can do at home, sit and bump? You go from it, you go from there and you start with number one, you go for it. And that's, and to be honest, that's the best social media advice you can ever have. Because if day one, you do number one and day two, you post something on number two, you've got 30 things to post on. You've got a month's content there. And none of it's been repeated. Yeah. And you can pay me in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, any format. But what I'm trying to say to you is, once you've got your plan, it's up to you how you implement that plan. It's going to be based on your level of knowledge, your expertise, what you're most comfortable in. That's why you've got to put it in one to 30, not me. Don't let somebody else tell you what your priority is. Then what you can do is from that, you can refine that into who the people that are more interested in that. Because if your number one is Pilates, for example, then who's your market? What's the average age? What are those kind of people interested in? And then you research that. You know, If you know that people in that age and that demographic read this magazine and are interested in these things that's that's how magazines work you know they they know their market they know their demographic and they they put articles in there for that yeah. person you don't read men's health and then you get to page three and it's got you know compression tights for if you've got dvt <laughs> because the average age of the readers in the 20s and 30s so it's all high protein diets keep the new keto diet how to do one arm press-ups because they're the market yeah so they don't, they don't advertise purses and bags in there because they know that that's not what it's for. So um, what I'm trying to get at is you've got to just refine it for you. I, no one can teach you this. You've got to make that list and then say, right, what are the things I can do for my market, my interests, my area, where I live? Do you live rurally? Do you live in the city? What are the interests? And, what, and then most importantly, what are you interested in? Anything you don't like, take it off your list. Don't do the things you don't want to do or you can't do. And then you've got yourself a plan. And I think that's step one. People aren't willing to just pick up a pen and paper and just write it down. And let's make this more future proof. Type it on your phone because we've got to get rid of pen and paper as well. <laughs> but you, it's just a case of sometimes emptying your brain and doing, I know we joked about it, but sometimes you've got to sit back, have a look, write it all down, and go from step one and yeah. start again. And that's, that's all I've ever done. If you go back to that, right at the beginning of this podcast, I said, what did my mum say to me? If you don't like it, come back home. Yeah. Right. Do, do what I've just told you. This is the, everyone's homework. Do what I've just told you. If you don't like it, go back to the number one. That's all you've got to do. Because if you don't do it, you're doing nothing. There you Very go. Very clever. Very clever. Marvin, um, let's do a part two. Let's, let's do a follow-up to this in a few weeks. It'd be good because I think we'll get some good feedback on this. So um, if anybody wants to feedback to you, are you on mm. the socials now? Where can we find you? Yeah moved on from key on the social i'm not doing twitter anymore because i was doing things like telling people i've just put you know i've just put bays in my, in my coffee and i put it in the microwave for 40 seconds and i kind of found myself saying things i've just thought why am i commenting you know, watch telly and rather than watch the telly i was commenting on what's on the telly <laughs> i don't do twitter i'm not really keen on facebook anymore because you get it's just it's we've moved on i'm never gonna go to tiktok because I'm just not that young. Um, but either way, I, I'm on Instagram. I like Instagram still. So it's Marvin B360. You know where I need to get you on. And when I get another invite, I'm going to get you on because this platform is made for you. And it's called Clubhouse. Oh my God. It's made for you. It's made for me and you. You just, oh, wow. it's voice. It's, you have debates. You open a room. So you and I could start a room about fitness professionals and COVID rehabilitation. And it would attract thousands of, there's a lot of Americans on there. And then you and I would chair the meeting. People come up. Oh. I'm going to invite you. It's the referee. It's made for you, Marvin. This you know what? Made for you. Sorry to bring this back. We said this in China. There was a, there's a sports yeah. bar, sports bar in my house called Camel. Right, funny name. And uh, I used to go and watch all the sport because obviously because of the time change, all the football, which is my interest, started at sort of 8 p.m. in the evening. So I'd be in there till 
four in the morning. And um, they used to do these live debates in the evening. And a uh, fellow that I used to play football with out there, he used, to, he used to be the chair and basically he'd pick a topic and then he'd basically split the room up into red and blue and you went and sat on the side of the room whether he was for or against it. And then he'd give you open mics to go up for a few minutes and yeah. give you a bit. This is it. This is a oh, virtual... Crikey. It's a new social media platform called Clubhouse. Um, and I'm addicted to it. It's like talk radio. You like talk radio. I like talk radio. Yeah, yeah. So it's like talk radio and you get all the big hitters, the US big hitters, of course, are all on it. And the English now are just coming in um, and everyone's trying to do a land grab. You know, when, when a new social yeah. media platform comes, everyone's in a land grab. But it's made for you. I'm going to get you an invite and then we can do that. I'll bend some but, people's out of shape there. They are. Mm-hmm. I'm not controversial, I'm just realistic. No, I think that's, really? I'm just trying to put it into context for people that they can take it away and actually do it. I'm not saying anything that anyone can't do or anyone doesn't agree with necessarily. I don't really, I'm, I don't really sit on the controversial fence that often. I'm just kind of, a, well, just be realistic. You're a good observer and you're a good, you're a good pragmatic person. You're a planner and you will do step one, two, three, where I'll go, right, let's start with step 27. <laughs> And then let's go that, back to step two. That's why it worked though, Rach. Because we'd, <laughs> we'd sit in the car for 200 miles, we'd have an idea, and by the end of it, we was doing... We had a plan. We had a plan. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. So otherwise, everyone can find you over on uh, Instagram. Yeah, come on there. And it's been lovely to talk to you. Thanks yeah, and you. for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the invite. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the Rachel Holmes podcast show. Don't forget to subscribe in iTunes and leave us a review. And if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please get in touch.